Hello out there. Um, this is Barbara Berry from Cultural Connections, and our webinar on distance learning and museums will go live at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, which is in just about one minute. Um, Susan Spiro and Ann Cravill are in the meeting with me. So I um, hope we have a lot of participants out there. I know we have 30 registrants signed up from the San Francisco Bay Area as well as um, other parts of the country. And I invite you to, um, I've enabled the Q&A, so I invite you to please start sending us some questions in the Q&A. And we will start this um, in earnest in less than one minute. So thank you for joining us. And I'd like to say while we're waiting, if you could tell us if you're out there by just um, saying hi where you're from, that would be terrific. That way you learn how to use the box and we can see who's joined us. Thank you. We'll see if anybody's out there yet. <laughs> There's also, I've been told, and I saw it actually in a webinar that I just did recently, a thumbs up and a thumbs down. And what happens is that as you're recording it, if you are liking something, you can click that green thumbs up. And then when the you go back to YouTube to record it, or to, to see the recording, you can see what the audience appeared to like. So if you're so inspired, click away. So my dashboard is telling me that we have two viewers now. Um, Excellent. Three viewers. So people are logging on. That's great to see the numbers. Um, so it is now 1 o'clock. And um, shall we start in earnest? Yes, we should indeed. Okay. Well, wel welcome to um, the Cultural Connections web webinar. I'm Barbara Berry. I'm a board member of Cultural Connections and um, also one of the, one of the organizers of this um, distance learning event. Cultural Connections is a community of San Francisco Bay Area um, uh, museum professionals. And uh, today our topic is how cultural institutions are using distance learning. So we thought it made most great sense to use a vehicle of distance learning, this Google Hangout on air, um, in for one of our events. And um, this is our maiden voyage with um, Google Hangout on Air. So thank you all for joining us. And please bear with us um, if there are any technical difficulties. Susan, Ann, and I have practiced over the last couple of weeks. And hopefully, this is going to be all 100% good to go. Um, this um, broadcast is being recorded. And we will post the link to that recording on our Cultural Connections Facebook page so that you can view it again or send it on to colleagues to view. And I'd like to give a shout out to one person who really helped us with um, getting this Hangout on air put together. That's Michelle Groey, who is joining us from Boston. She works with the Isabella Stort Gardner Museum, which, because of the snow there in Boston, is closed down today. I'm glad you're able to join us, Michelle. Um, she also works with the National Art Education, Education Association. Um, oh, there she is. And. Um, just helped out. They have some great Hangout on Air that are recorded. And Michelle, I tried to put the link up on our showcase, but I don't think I succeeded. So if you could send that link, um, put it up in the question area. And also, we will put it on our Facebook page. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome everyone. Um, and I'm going to, I'm also pleased to welcome our key speaker, who is Anne Cravill from Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and Susan Spiro from JFK University Museum Studies, who will be moderating the program. I am turning it over to you, Susan. Thanks, Barbara. And welcome, everybody. And uh, please, everyone, do take advantage of the, of the pieces in the side, the questions in the side, because I'm going to be paying attention to that. Um, I, see some, I know from the list of who reserved, there are some people that I know. Others of you, I'm real interested to, to see what your questions are. Um, I've had a delightful time talking with um, Ann Craybell from Crystal Bridges. She comes to us with some deep experience um, in distance learning and is basically going to give us some, a really good introduction to some of the ideas and then go do a deep dive into a project that she's been working on. So Ann, why don't you go ahead and start us off. I understand you're going to start with some thoughts about common vocabulary and show us some art uh, museum examples. Sure. Well, um, thank you all for inviting me. I'm really pleased. Um, are you able to see me on the screen? Because I'm not yes. popping up there. OK, yes. fantastic. So bear with us. We will probably be asking some technical questions along the way, just to make sure everybody is able to see and hear us. 
But I thought what I would do first is um, share a little bit with you all the context um, for Crystal Bridges, if you're not familiar with our museum, um, and really the driving force behind what our distance learning program uh, was informed by. And hopefully that will give you some sense of kind of what is currently happening in the field. So I'm going to switch to my screen share. And Barbara, got it. can you confirm? Okay, I'm great. Confirmed. Wonderful. All right, so Crystal Bridges is located in Arkansas. We are um, pretty much in the center of the country. And, you know, far far away from, from where you all are, right in the middle there. Um, and just in case you didn't know where Bentonville, where Northwest Arkansas is, we're right in the corner of the state. And we touch um, Oklahoma, Missouri, uh, Kansas is very close by, Tennessee, and Louisiana. So, a little bit about Arkansas. This is kind of the stereotypical, um, you know, thought of Arkansas. And this is a artwork by Edward Washburn, and he kind of created this uh, planters versus the uh, share, you know, tenant farmers. Um, and it really became reappropriated as a stigma for this part of the country. And it was something that actually, I think, was uh, a criticism when Crystal Bridges was first announced as a project because lots of people on the East and West Coast felt like, why would you put a first-rate museum in the middle of the country so far away from where people could actually uh, enjoy it? But despite this, our founder, Alice Walton, um, persevered with the project. And this is actually the site where the project took place in 2006. This was a family property. And um, Crystal Spring actually ran through the center of this uh, piece of the property, just a little trickle. And she was looking for an architect who would be the perfect, you know, sort of visionary for this project. And she selected Moshe Safdie. And I know he's done um, uh, buildings out in California. Uh, the Skirball Center, for instance, which is actually very much connected to the architecture of this building. And this was the first kind of rendering of um, what he envisioned Crystal Bridges might look like, and, and just a sort of scribble on a napkin uh, rendering. And then he, he really kind of modeled it so that it would be set within the earth. And I think this image here gives you a sense of that. The yellow tarps are literally um, where the rock bed had been carved down so that the back of the building is literally set into the earth. Um, and the whole property is in the shape of a ravine. So when you drive to the property, you, you actually don't see the museum. You really have to descend into the museum. And then this is, you know, uh, five years later, the building progress that had happened. Every time they drilled down into the bedrock, uh, they might have hit a cavern, they might have hit some sort of um, granite that had to be um, carved. So just establishing the foundation took quite some time. And then you can see here the progress where um, the, the name Crystal Bridges is because literally we have these galleries that act as bridges. And the roof is also a suspension roof, so um, it actually was installed first and hangs from two suspension wires, and then the walls were put up. And then this is um, an image of what it looks like now with the crystal spring actually filled, and so the building actually sits within the water. And then this is an aerial of the campus. So the museum is about 200,000 square feet, and it sits in 120 acres of what was previously Walton uh, family property and is now um, part of Crystal Bridges campus. So we have five centuries of American art, and it is installed chronologically um, with lots of different connections through uh, the galleries. So different stories are told through the galleries. And it winds its way literally all the way starting with the colonial era um, and then working its way into uh, contemporary art. And then, as I said, we have 120 acres. And so the um, property has about three and a half miles worth of trails that connect to all of the different neighborhoods in downtown Bentonville as well. One of the most amazing things, so the building is an amazing thing, but one of the most amazing things Crystal Bridges has is an incredible philanthropic community. And uh, when I started actually as a school and community programs manager about three and a half years ago, part of my responsibility was getting our school programs uh, uh, ready to roll out. We had an incredible gift from the Walker Family Foundation, and this is actually Pat Walker. They gave a $10 million endowment to school programs. 
And this endowment covers 100% reimbursement for school transportation. And this is from anywhere. So you could be a student coming from three, four hours away. And as long as the mileage is within um, the athletics rate, we will reimburse at 100%. This has been incredible. We've been able to get lots of students um, from all over the, the region as a result. It also provides 100% uh, reimbursement for substitute teachers and it provides 100% of the students with a healthy lunch so that teachers don't have to worry about the long distance that they're traveling um, or worry about getting you know, their cafeteria uh, to make a lunch if they, you know, for some reason their students are Title I. So you can imagine we had a, a problem as a result of this. We had a lot of people that wanted to come and we did not necessarily have the capacity to serve all of those people. So it gave us the opportunity to create a random assignment evaluation working with researchers at the University of Arkansas, Jay Green, Brian Casita, and Dan Bowen. They designed a research study where we had to randomly give who got to come on a tour right away and who got delayed treatment. And because it was random, we were able to do a matched pair design where on average, both groups were the same. And what we found with the groups that came Oh, in addition, I should say, one of the reasons why it was such a great opportunity as well is because not only did we have um, an oversubscription and could do a lottery, but this was the only museum in a region previously where the closest was Tulsa, which is two hours away, or Little Rock, which is three and a half. So the majority of the school students here had never really had a field trip experience as part of their um, schooling. So it was, it was sort of a virgin audience, if you will, to really measure the impacts of a one-time field trip to a museum. And so we had the perfect petri dish to uh, really look at, you know, what happens in a one hour, a one hour visit. And what we found was that not only do students retain information about what they've learned, you know, our tours are very much a, a conversation and a dialogue in the galleries where students observe things and we validate those observations with contextual information um, and inquiry. But the students also increased their critical thinking skills, and this was when they were looking at a work of art and actually designed um, Michelle Grohe, uh, working in her, her research at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, um, designed a critical thinking um, exercise to really see if after having this type of experience, students are able to infer, observe, um, and lots of other outcomes when looking at a work of art. Students also had increased tolerance and increased historical empathy. So we wanted to look at some of those non-cognitive outcomes that we think are, are part of a museum visit as well. But the really interesting finding from this was that students from rural communities and lower socioeconomic schools benefited two to three times more. So this is kind of a deprivation story. Um, you know, because they had less access to this kind of a cultural experience, the benefit was that much greater for them. So this led us to our next question of how can we reach more rural students? Um, and, you know, we were thinking of creating some sort of a, a distance learning program, but we honestly did not know what that that meant what a distance learning program um, could possibly be. You know, I was familiar with, uh, you know, video conferencing and things like that, but I didn't know if that was what we wanted to do. Um, we just had this, this uh, mission of we want to reach more rural students and we want to do so in deeper and uh, more meaningful ways. So we were really fortunate to receive a grant that allowed us to bring together um, arts organizations and art museums from throughout the country that were in various stages of their distance learning uh, programs. And there were really many different models out there. And what I'm going to do now is sort of share some of the different models that we have and um, or that, that were presented um, and then talk a little bit about uh, how those models informed what we decided to pursue as well as some other things like policy levers that were in place that really informed our next steps. Before I do that, I'm going to take a breath. And Barbara, do you have any kind of questions um, or any, anything that needs clarification? Well, one of the things I was going to just pop in um, to say is that I really appreciate you sort of setting the stage for why distance learning really has propelled the work that you've done. That rural state, that meeting the need, and being able to provide something different, I think has really been crucial, crucial and important. Um, Barbara tells me that we have about 20 people on, this, on um, the webinar today. I'm going to remind everybody that there is a questions bar. Please um, say hello if you want to do that. And if um, 
be sure to ask questions of our wonderful guest of Anne today. She's ha more than happy to answer things. You'll also see that there's like plus one and so a way for you to rank them. If you see a question that somebody else offers up that you like or your own question, obviously you can rank it and those will rise to the top. And then Barbara, who's sort of doing our master control, will be able to um, help say we're answering a particular question and highlight it so that the video that gets to stay with us later is, is there. Um, Anne, you ready to change gears? Sure, I'm ready. All right. So, one of um, the majority of the presentations, as I said, they all had very different models. Um, some were synchronous, some were asynchronous, and some were blended. And I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with this terminology. Uh, just in case you're not, I'm going to walk you through some of the actual um, programs that are out there that were presented uh, at the Distance Learning Summit so that you can see uh, the different ways that you can approach distance learning. So, and, and I will add here that there's some incredibly wonderful resources on your distance learning site and that everybody has a chance and it's one of the joys of distance learning is that everybody has a chance to get in and see it. Yes, so if you go onto our website and go to the distance learning tab, um, all of the case studies were documented in video um, and then we did some, some research as well with the University of Nebraska really looking at um, how, how we as uh, institutions can better serve rural communities. So one of the more traditional uh, models, as I said, I was very, very familiar with video conferencing, um, and I think that this was what I just intuitively went to when I thought about distance learning. I thought about virtual field trips. And this is the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and they use a, a video conferencing system. Lots of museums um, and lots of schools back in the day were able to receive money from the Department of Agriculture uh, to create this infrastructure. And it really was um, uh, with the mission of, of bringing rural students to these kinds of um, enrichment types of activities. The Smithsonian American Art Museum, they also had uh, the mission of being able to serve the whole country because they are a federal institution. And they also needed to be able to serve students that were abroad um, in uh, embassy schools and uh, I believe, um, you know, uh, military schools as well. And so they had really kind of perfected this program where they have a green screen, they have the presentation then up, they're able to see themselves, they're able to see um, the students on the other screen. Uh, and we actually had people on both ends. So I was able to see what it was like for the educator, and then we had people um, who were able to see what it was like for the students. And there was varying degrees of um, success, as long as you know the, the students were all able to fit into the screen, as long as there weren't too many students participating at once, um, then it was a, a very great way to kind of simulate or give a virtual field trip experience. Um, Another model is uh, much more new to distance learning, and that's a massive open online course, so a MOOC, as they are called. And MoMA was one of the first uh, museums to be able to create a MOOC. Uh, Coursera was getting ready to launch a new initiative to increase teacher professional development. And if you're not familiar with Coursera, it's a wonderful platform where um, Ivy League uh, schools and, and really just great schools in higher ed offer courses that are completely free to anybody in the world. Um, and, you know, they're, they're massive, though. Because they're free, because they're open, you can have, you know, 50,000 students in that space. MoMA happened to have 17,000 learners from across the globe uh, over this four-week period. And this was uh, led by Lisa Mazzola. They've actually launched um, another one that already took place. And uh, it was a great sort of way to see how can museums possibly have scale? You know, how can we really reach um, a large amount of viewers but try and engage people in a deep and meaningful way that's within best practice for museum education? I'm going to add that Stephanie Powell, who's going to be part of the live um, session that we're going to have at Cal Academy this coming Tuesday, she's going to be there. She actually worked on some of this MOOC, and she'll be going into some details. and. As she says, I'm not the expert with distance learning, but she was really involved with this and was one of the faces. She worked at MoMA at the time, and she's now here back in the Bay Area at SF MoMA. Great, yes. And I know, um, you know, Lisa Mazzola felt the exact same way. She, she didn't think a MOOC would be possible and was very hesitant to sort of be the face and to be the teacher on the other end. But in, uh, afterwards, and uh, upon reflection, um, she really found a lot of great benefit um, to working in that way. 
And so let me back up because I, I introduced those three words. Here we have a synchronous program, right? So this is live, this is taking place in real time. The educators are on one end, the learners are on the other end, and they are um, exchanging information, mostly in the form of audio and video, in real time. Whoops. Then with MoMA's case, it was an asynchronous program. So it was paced, and the, the learners came online, and they progressed through the program week by week. Um, but they could come on any time that they wanted to. Not only that, they could access a previous week's information any time that they wanted to. So they could kind of go back and forth. There was lots of different ways for them to engage with the learners, um, but it was never at the same time. So if there was a discussion board, for instance, um, the teachers, the facilitators on the other end would be answering that at a separate time from when the learners were engaging with that program. So it really is um, advantageous when you're trying to collect with a global community, people have different time zones, or just um, provide something that's very flexible for a learner to do on their own time in their own space. And, and I think about the MoMA one in some ways as being a broadcast model in many ways where they are broadcasting, you can choose how much, you know, when you do a Coursera course, you tend to go in there because it gives you a chance to get access to experts on a particular topic. And MoMA obviously is in one, one of those roles where we consider them to be an expert on modern art, obviously. So I think that broadcast model is, is, is pretty much underneath a lot of what a MOOC does. Yeah, and um, they also really leveraged a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer learning tools. So mm -hmm. it, was really, it was really dependent on the learners engaging with each other um, and you know, discussing the readings and discussing the videos as well um, so that there was that kind of uh, constructivist model of um, you know, developing new ways of thinking and new ideas um, that wouldn't take place necessarily, uh, say, for instance, with like a Khan Academy where you're, you're literally just watching the video. Right, and we're actually going to have a representative from Khan Academy on, on Tuesday as well, so this is great. Thanks. Great, great. So you'll be primed. Um, yeah. Okay, and so then another model, uh, the blended model, the North Carolina Museum of Art has, I, I will actually say they were the trailblazers for me, for, for our model, um, but they have a new initiative that is a blended approach where students um, get, prepare for a program at the museum as a flipped model. They receive a lot of information in a learning management system and engage with museum educators in advance of their museum visit. Um, and then you can see they're all brought together and they, they come from all over the state um, and they've been engaging with, each, with these students from all over the state. Um, and they come together for a residency program with actual practicing artists. So Michelle Harrell and Emily Kotecki um, have done a phenomenal job in really pushing the envelope of how it is museums can engage with K-12 schools and K-12 learners. Um, and as I said, when they presented um, their, their model to me at our Distance Learning Summit, it really kind of just set my excitement off on the direction that we wanted to pursue. So I will talk a little bit about that. Um, two things were happening. We had the Distance Learning Summit. We were learning about all of these different models. We also had some policies coming into place in the state of Arkansas, and this is happening really throughout the nation. One of them was the Digital Learning Act, and what that spelled out was that all high school students starting in the year 2014-15 would have to have an online course in order to graduate. And they defined digital learning as not being required in the traditional bell schedule, so students could do this um, from their house, they could do this at any time, or compressed video. So that first example that I gave from the Smithsonian, that's compressed video. And that was how our distance learning in the state used to be. So it needed to be available either in a blended learning environment or um, in an LMS system. So this, this really um, was a catalyst for us pursuing a different um, a different approach to distance learning. And I'm going to insert in here, Anne, you use the word LMS. That's a learning management system. So um, for many of you have um, used them through college, but it's a very particular closed system where you can protect students' privacy for what they're doing, but it's key because that privacy aspect is, is important for that interaction. I'll also add that, and you're going to go to this chart, Look at California. It's different, I think, than what Arkansas is doing. Go ahead, Anne. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, a really good point. So uh, this is from INACOL, which is the International uh, Online K-12 Learning Association. 
it, I'll spell it. It's I N A C O L. They have lots of really, really great resources about the state of online learning and K-12 education today. And this is one of their snapshots. So what you can see is um, the country, the green um, states have an actual virtual school. The, this is, I'm sorry, the, the sort of bluish greenish states have a virtual school. The really pale green states have what's called course choice. And this is, um, Louisiana has this option, Florida has this option. It's where students can actually choose from multiple different providers that are online or even on site and create their school schedule based on those online providers. California does not have either of these programs um, in place. I, and I know that there's definitely online coursework happening because they have presented at the INACOL conference, but it's probably at the district level or within well, charter schools. And I went looking. I don't have a definitive answer yet. What it seems to be is that there are online course options for students in California. And if anybody in the audience knows more, please pipe in. Um, and they, they seem to be run as private organizations, um, meaning the, that they they don't have the state has not taken an initiative yet. But um, I think that there's going to be something ahead, and I think us understanding that it's there um, will make a difference. Because your state is so advanced, the kind of strategy that you're taking, I think, begins to make a lot of sense. Yeah, and um, you know, our state very, very quickly adapted to that Digital Learning Act. You know, previously, as I said, it was all done through video in real time. So the students would actually go to a classroom and they would look up at a video and they would have their teacher, um, who may be you know hundreds of miles away from them, but in real time teaching them. Um, and they very, very quickly, you know, converted their model to be an asynchronous model that used a learning management system. So our online provider for the Department of Education in the state of Arkansas is Virtual Arkansas. And they are not a um, degree granting institution. What they are is a supplementary uh, institution where a student, and this is really, really critical for students that are in rural communities, um, if they don't have specialists, if there is a teacher shortage in, you know, say, advanced placement courses or remediation, they're able to go onto Virtual Arkansas and take the course at minimal cost to their district. I mean, it is very, very, very um, inexpensive uh, for these students. They uh, launched, you know, their new model last fall, and they were planning, I believe, to teach 14,000 students, and they have well over 20,000 that are taking classes with them. So, for us. You know, we really and felt like. Let me ask you yes. a quick question. Do you know why it has been so popular? Is, is think, it really just access to courses, or or why? I think part of it is this um, digital learning act. So that now that there is a requirement in place, it's dif okay. it's difficult for districts, particularly small districts. And you know, we have some districts here that are less than 350 students, just to give you a sense of how small. If they are less than, no, I'm sorry, just at 350, if they are less than, they have to consolidate. But, I mean, they're small. And so you can imagine a district does not have the ability to create their own online course offering. So instead, they tap into virtual Arkansas. Um, so the students, it's access to courses, but it's also this requirement for sure that they have to take an online course for graduation. Fascinating. So, um, you know, we decided that we would partner with them. I, I was not in the uh, mindset of suddenly having a fleet of online instructors um, that we would be able to hire and that we would be able to teach. I felt like a better model was to look at who's out there providing online courses and how can we partner with them and how can we leverage their human capital, um, their, their uh, staff, to actually reach more students and eventually scale this up. And so I'll just kind of walk you through the process of what it took for us to get to where we are. Um, and then I am uh, going to have, have some time for uh, Susan to ask some questions. And then we're going to go into a deep dive of the course. Um, the first thing we did, there's, there should be a bullet above this that's called, you need to get money. <laughs> so we had to find some funding um, to create uh, a RFP, where a request for proposals, where companies um, could demonstrate their proven ability, their, their track record to create really, really engaging online courses. We ended up going with EDC, which is um, 
uh, education development uh, consultancy. They have an arm called EdTech Leaders. They are a nonprofit company located in Newton, Massachusetts, and they have a great um, track record of not only doing professional development for teachers, but of just creating really beautiful, um, engaging courses with the best instructional design. Um, then we needed to find partners to offer and to teach the course. And so, as I mentioned, that was Virtual Arkansas. They're in the business of teaching online. We're in the business of you know, creating really great content. We want to be able to give our great content to them so that they can spread that out to the state. And eventually, we'll be able to spread that out to partners throughout the, the nation, if not world. Um, we needed to then outline the course and work with the selected partner to um, lay out the instructional design and the activities. So this process took a long time. It probably took, I'd say, six months, and it was incredibly messy. We started at first with um, a course that was really art in the service of history, and um, you know realized that this was we wanted an art course, not um, a history course. And so I had to jump ship and, and rewrite the whole process, um, but it was incredibly fun, incredibly stimulating. And so once we really kind of articulated what the course goals were and figured out the design, then we had to contract some content developers. So we've got about 64 works of art in the online course, and we didn't really have any content for them at all. So I did have a wonderful group of writers and um, developers who helped to create content for the course. Then I will say that we successfully have um, received course approval so that this course is uh, half a credit in fine arts, which is a requirement for high school students in the state of Arkansas. They all have to have half a credit of fine arts to graduate. And students who want to take additional coursework in the arts, this counts towards their six required credits um, for career and college focus. So these, this course will count towards their graduation, which I think is a huge incentive for them to not only register for the course, but to um, finish the course. Unlike a MOOC, um, MOOCs generally don't have a lot of completers. I am you know, definitely one of the people who have taken a MOOC and have enjoyed what I've learned, but I have not completed the course. And we really wanted to make sure that we had some sort of a program that uh, required that the learners have a little bit of skin in the game as well. The bullet in green, launch and refine, that is exactly where we are right now. We are in week three of offering this course online to high school students in the state. Uh, it's a very small little pilot group. I always say if I'm going to fail, I want to fail small. So we want to test it with a small group of students and really make all of the changes and adjustments to the course that we need to do before we get to the last part of this, which is scaling. So we want to create a um, promotional campaign and a distribution plan so that we can scale this course. Coupled with that, we need to create an online um, professional development program so that we can certify any teacher who wants to be able to teach this course in an online asynchronous program and then license the course to them. So eventually, we really hope any teacher who is interested in this type of content and wants to have an additional fine arts offering in their um, district or in their charter school or in their home school um, is able to take the course, or private school, is able to take the course and offer that course to their students. Go ahead. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's really a comp, you know, before, you know, let me let you catch your breath for a minute. A couple things I think that you and I talked about before that I, that I want to um, have you elaborate on a little bit, and I want to remind everybody who's watching, please feel free to add questions. I'm looking for any from the audience as well so that I can ask Anne and get her to um, give, a, give you answers to your questions. Um, we talked about your budget for this and what mm -hmm. it was, and this might be one of those um, one of those moments where you want to talk a little bit about budgets. And then I actually do have a question. Um, thank you, Jessica, for doing that. I see it. Um, what was your budget, and how did you get there? Sure. So, um, you know, I have somebody who is uh, helping me sort of navigate uh, these waters. He used to be a, um, the executive director for Florida Virtual. His name is Bruce Friend, and he's um, very, very knowledgeable. And the first thing I asked him was, well, you know, what does it, what does it cost to, to create a semester-long course? And his answer was, how much do you want to spend? <laughs> you know, it's, it can be as massive. That's tech projects. You know, tech projects are expensive if they're going to be done well. Yes. Um, and so what did you end up doing? So we ended up, we, I, I'll say that, you know, all said and done um, with, you know, our, our content developers and everything, we're probably at around 120 to 150. 
Um, and that is um, something that we were able to receive 100% funding for. But that does not mean that if you want to create an online course, it's going to be that expensive at all. There's models out there where, um, particularly with colleges, with universities that have global campuses, where they have instructional designers, there's virtual schools that would love to create these things um, in, in collaboration with the museum. Um, and then there's also, you know, really inexpensive learning management systems like, you know, from all the way to free, Moodle, um, to other learning management systems where you can create your own content. So really, it just depends on, you know, how, how big of scale you want to have um, and how, what kind of shelf life you want to have. And for us, this was really something where we were looking for a return on investment where eventually we can scale it up and reach as many learners as possible so that when you think about gosh, if we reach 2,000 learners in maybe the first year, the return on the investment is huge. Year after year after year, it becomes pennies per learner. Absolutely. Jessica is asking, um, she, well, she's, first of all, she wants to, she says, this course is, well, it's not running quite yet, but it will be free for the participants, or it is at the districts that are going to pay for it? So Let me get that part first. Yes, the way that Virtual Arkansas works is a district subscribes to Virtual Arkansas. I think it's around 2,000 um, a year for their entire district. And then students can sign up for any course that Virtual Arkansas offers for $15. The student is not paying, the district is paying. So nothing comes out of the student. This is exactly as though they are signing up for an in-person course in their bricks and mortar school. All right, and then to go back to the funding, um, can you talk a little bit, Jessica asked, can you talk a little bit more about how you funded the project? Was this an individual donor, or did you have to, you know, cobble together a bunch of different kind of sponsorship for it? No, we had um, the same sponsor that brought um, all of the museums together for the Distance Learning Summit it was the Windgate Foundation, um, and they're an incredibly generous foundation uh, and a great supporter of arts organizations throughout the country. Um, so we were able to do this with one funder and, um, you know, hopefully, I like to think of it, and I write a little bit about this in, in what you're going to plug for the Journal of Museum Education, but I like to think of it as they're, they're a little bit of an investor in helping us to um, create this and then have a model where we had this public-private partnership where we release it to Virtual Arkansas as part of their portfolio of offerings, and then they're able to sustain it because you know it's just it's part of their model in terms of course distribution. Yeah, so you you you're, you're cobbling together a lot of um, mutual interests through the process. Yes. The other the other thing I'm interested in, and I, I always appreciate it when somebody says, "Oh my goodness, it was six months and really messy," because I think a lot of what we do oftentimes is sort of a messy process. Who was at the table when you were making the curricular decisions? What voices did you pull together so that you could say, "Oh, I think we're doing this with history," but then you changed your mind? How did you know who was who was there and brought in on the discussion? Did you have teachers? Did you have students? What did, were you doing with that? Great question. So um, I started first just with two part-time museum educators that work in our school programs department and um, they both, one has a, a really deep background in history. She's just finished her master's degree in history um, and particularly American history and the other um, was a retired classroom teacher so she's got great knowledge just in terms of student learning. Um, and then working with EDC, we brought together instructional designers and some other subject matter expertise that they had on their team um, to add to the framework that we created. So we were able to identify some of the big questions we wanted to talk about and the artworks that we wanted to talk about and address. And then they were really able to add uh, instructional activities and primary sources to our outline to fully flesh it out. So, you know, Google Docs was a, a huge asset for us, you know, working in that kind of environment. Um, but uh, it really was, um, I'd say, a, a mixture that started small internally and then grew from there. Once we could, we had to provide them with something, some so framework you had to start from. Three or four people in house and eventually about a team of 10. You yep. know, yeah. That, that feels All, about right. Yes. And, and this was nobody's primary project. You know, these, this was, nobody Always. was working on this full time. Yeah. <laughs> Always. Yeah. And that's the six month messy process. It's just how these things get themselves gone together. Um, yeah. To that end, you were with school and teacher programs, and then you are, are in this position of being the distance learning manager. What was the decision internally to have you then become in that role? And then we'll, then we'll go do the deep dive. 
Sure. We had um, a lot of um, uh, changes happening, and I had an interest in um, research. And so because we had this distance learning the project, um, I was really encouraged by leadership here to pursue doctoral studies in educational policy under Jay Green, who actually was the one who did the um, field trip study. Okay. And so my toes are in two ponds. I'm right now working on um, the online course program and you know the next phase of that program. Um, and then I spend the rest of my time um, taking horrible math classes. So. <laughs> it happens. Right. <laughs> Why don't you tour us through the, the product as it stands now? Okay, great. So I'm going to um, stop. You know, before actually I do that, I just want to give you um, uh, a quick overview of how we decided to structure this course. It is called Museum Mashup, American Identity Through the Arts. And we started with the question of how did we get here? So it's a backwards approach to starting with contemporary works of art um, and then working our way backwards into colonial and it really does explore the idea of identity in various um, ways and, and from you know literal individual identity to um, the identity of the nation to uh, the identity of you know uh, how the environment informs and shapes identity and um, part of that was because one of our museum educators the, uh, Emily Rodriguez the one who has the masters in history she said you know I always just got so frustrated with my history courses because we, we ran out of time and I never got to the contemporary stuff so we thought it was really important um, coming back for a second really important to be able to um, kind of get kids excited about history from the framework of let's start with the present so now I'm going to take you into a deep dive of the course itself and I'll let you know when it's on the screen. Okay, hang on one second. I'm going to switch tabs here. And I'll, I'll take this moment to remind people, please do ask questions if you've got them by uh, typing them in. Uh, um, Barbara's uh, for Cultural Connections is um, playing the pilot there and clicking on them to get us to pay attention to them. Uh, it's up. Okay, yeah. great. All right. So just, we're, uh, we're, 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 you're going to slide down, right? Yes. Yes. Got it. We're moving. Yeah. And All right. Yes. All right. So I will preface this with um, Virtual Arkansas uses Blackboard, which is their learning management system. And it's really kind of clunky and not the most attractive. So this is the first thing that you see. Um, and it's, it's not how we wanted our course structured. Uh, we also did not want to develop anything in one specific learning management system because then it wouldn't be um, applicable to organizations who perhaps used a different learning management system. So everything was developed in HTML5 and kind of hangs within their um, learning management system. So while you see this as the first page and it's a little bit um, unattractive, when you actually go into the sessions, what you see is a little bit more of a clean um, appearance with easier navigation. So here's session one, and it starts with the big idea. As I said, have you ever asked yourself, how did you get here? And students um, have a sense of what they're going to be doing in this session, very clearly articulated. You'll read, you're going to share, you're going you're to create. And then they navigate through this session. And again, they can do this at any time. Um, over the course of one week, they navigate through using just these simple buttons at the top. So we have various um, activities each week. This was like an orientation week, so they were getting to know Crystal Bridges. Um, they were also getting to know the tools that they were using. One of the tools that we used is VoiceThread. And it was incredibly important to me to not lose the interactivity and the discussion that takes place on a real tour. I really wanted to make sure that students had a, an opportunity to engage with each other. And so VoiceThread ends up being one of the most perfect tools to do that. I'm going to um, pull up our most recent one. VoiceThread initially used to be a free free thing that you could do. I just went looking for it and teachers and you know everything now has a little bit of a subscription fee for it. But it is a really wonderful interface um, for having something that shows up and then everybody gets to talk about it. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, I, there's you know the traditional uh, discussion thread which we use in this course as well. 
um, when we want students to reflect or maybe write a little bit more. But you know, they kind of get a little cumbersome in terms of the breadcrumb style way of navigating through them. And you don't have the image um, as readily available. So I love this because the image is right there. So here is um, a work, The Ward, by George Tuker. And I just want to read, this is from a student in Deer, Arkansas, which is a very rural um, community. Uh, and she writes, George Tooker's The Ward is a very interesting piece that shows to have many subliminal messages. In the background, there are many American flags hanging on the wall in much brighter contrast to the rest of the painting. I recognize this as a representation of patriotism and American pride. Going on to the next part of the painting, the elderly people lined up in rows on beds. There isn't much to identity the various elderly by, except, as Madeline said, they have little or no hair. So she's referencing a previous student's observations. So they are most likely men. The elderly people are lined up on these beds, which do not appear to be comfortable by their stiff appearance. It seems that these people are just existing, not really being anything other than a case number or a medical condition. I believe that this represents the wounded soldiers that have returned from the various wars. When the soldiers came back from the war wounded, this is how they were treated oftentimes, in a lifeless building or tent, not having anything to do or participate in, often making them become depressed, which slowed or stopped the healing process completely. When Tucker made this painting, I wonder why he depicted the wounded soldier scene as so dreary and negative when he could have followed in the footsteps of others and sugarcoated to pacify the public and make it seem appealing enough. For Tucker's honesty in this painting, I admire him greatly. He really got his point across that the war wasn't pleasant, and it wasn't pleasant afterwards either, because these memories still haunt you. So that's just an example of, you know, one girl's, I think, incredible insights. And then we have some things that are not quite as, as sophisticated or deep as her, but definitely they're still, um, they're students engaging and they're building off of different ideas um, from each other. And as a teacher who loves, who uses discussion threads as part of the coursework that I do, um, it's really wonderful to see what are different people thinking at once. And um, it's a really, really great tool. And I agree with you, having the image in the center there for everyone to see throughout is good. And I'm going to remind you, we are at 1.45, so we have about 15 minutes. Okay, great. And questions so, uh, from the group, too, please. You are welcome so, uh, to ask. We, you know, we use traditional um, discussion threads as well. So you can see here, after they've read um, information about George Tooker and Andy Warhol, the two artists that they're exploring this week, and they've watched various videos, we ask them to share how their ideas have changed from their initial observations. Um, and, you know, this is very much how our process works in the galleries. We're asking them to contribute their thoughts and ideas based on what they see, and then we're offering some information, and um, students are offering information, and then their ideas are starting to change uh, and become, you know, deeper and richer based off of that information that they, they gather. So they, um, every week, will explore two works of art, and they're building towards two capstone projects. One project, um, and I can't take you in to see it because it's an, an account-based thing, but one project uses what's called Capsule, which is kind of like a Pinterest-style um, board where they are actually curating an exhibition about their own identity. So we really want them to reflect upon you know, their um, place and you know, interpretation of their own identity in the world. And then the second uh, capstone project that they're working on is creating in an online gallery environment an uh, exhibition uh, that is related to American identity using works that they've learned about, but also other works from the collection. So I'm going to take you into this space, and I'm just going to warn you that if for some reason, Susan, I drop out, I'll connect right back on, um, and you can um, facilitate some discussion and questions. So are you able to see the screen? I am able to see the screen. Great. So this was uh, an online gallery that was created by David Charles Frederick at the University of Arkansas. He's a super talented um, classics professor, but he's really gotten into game design. And so he's used Unity Game Engine to create a 3D rendering of one of our um, bridge galleries. And let me see if I can start a new gallery. Here we go. And so he got the plans of this actual space. And you can see you can navigate through it. And this is what it actually looks like. You can go ahead and place the roof on it. It's particularly fun to see this because 
we saw the site earlier and the students are actually able to play in 3D. I'm thinking about my gamer son. I think he'd have a good time running around in this. Yeah, and so through the course, they are learning about the curatorial process. We have videos from um, uh, one of our curators, Chad Alligood, uh, who curated the State of the Art exhibition most recently. And so they're learning about, you know, um, how he uh, uses story as a way to frame uh, exhibition. They're also learning from uh, our graphic designer about how she comes up with the graphic identity of an exhibition. And then they're learning from um, our education team, too, in terms of interpretation and interpretive materials. So these students are going to have to create their own exhibition, including, so you can see here, the wall labels. So they'll have to write the wall labels. Um, and then they'll be able to navigate through each other's exhibition. This is not online yet for them. This is still somewhat in beta. Um, we're going to open it up in week nine once we have a few things like frames um, placed on the paintings. But it's a really great way, I think, for them to be able to engage. And you can see here how you can actually walk through um, the space. You can walk. We have environment with each other. We've got a question from Jessica. She's asking, how are the students evaluated on their work through this course, and who provides the feedback? And you know, how do you get? You know, it's always about distance learning. How you yep. had peer to peer in the MOOC? What's going on with this course? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, we right now we have an instructor at Virtual Arkansas, so she's a licensed, certified um, fine arts instructor. Uh, she's leading the course, and I'm actually a student in the course, kind of helping her with it. We also designed um, rubrics for every single element in the course. So, uh, for instance, in the discussion threads, and it's made transparent to the students, um, all of the different elements of the discussion thread that need to be in there for them to get full credit. So we have a way for the um, teacher to actually evaluate, you know, based on specific criteria, if the students have hit all of those. And that's going to be really important as we scale up. Teachers are going to need to know, you know, what quality uh, looks like. So you're thinking about rubrics and you're thinking about all of those kinds of, you know, classic interactive, interactive questions that you need to be sure to judge when you look at what they're saying. Yeah, and even, you know, having examples, um, real student examples of what low quality looks like versus what high quality looks like. I will also say in this course, we have, I mean, we have a range of, um, I don't want to use the term abilities, but we have a range of different levels of student um, engagement and um, accommodations. So some students are going and they're reaching really deep. They've clearly had, you know, advanced placement English classes. Um, some students are actually on accommodations where they have to have limited assignments, and so we limit, you know, the discussion threads, and that's all taken into account in the grading process. We actually even have a student who's very low vision from the Arkansas School for the Blind in the course, and she's using online tools to be able to zoom in and really see these images and the texts in great detail. So this, as I said, you know, with just 30 students, we're really kind of going through every single step of what we need to anticipate a teacher might need to know um, in order to distribute and license this class to them. And we'll basically be creating that PD. So when do you, you know, sit back at the table and who's the team working now to say what are, our ne what are your next steps and where do you go? Well, we're still working with um, EDC and we are, um, you know, they, they are uh, helping to do this whole pilot course and they will be developing the online teacher professional development program as well. So we hope to have that available by late spring, early summer for teachers that are interested in um, being able to offer this course. And then um, we are looking at creating a second course where we are, it's going to be a little bit more of a making um, design. Uh, hands-on kind of course versus uh, more of a historical and humanities-based course. Um, and that's going to be available this time next year. So we will basically go through this whole process again and then create the teacher professional <laughs> development component that goes with, with that course. And then eventually both of these courses and the online PD will be available through what we're calling a teacher portal on our website. And this will be something where they can receive support, they can get distribution for it, they can, you know, troubleshoot technical things. And I'll be honest, all of that is like, you know, we're trying to come up with what's the best strategy and best approach um, to be able to do that. Because creating this is one thing, but maintaining it, maintaining all the links, just, just maintaining it is going to be another thing, just as you'd have to consider with any website. Well, it, and that's 
that's why having your position there so you can spearhead and think about all of those various all those variables and make sure that you stay on top of it becomes I think so crucially important. Um, I am once again going to encourage the audience that if you have any questions where um, we've got an open slate for new questions you can pop things up um, and some other thoughts about your deep dive um, so you've got two other courses going forward you um, are trying to figure out what's really working what do you think um, Kara is just asked what are some of the challenges you are facing with scalability yeah um, I don't know yet <laughs> so that's a great question but um, you know the the biggest part of this this was to be able to have scale that was something that you know leadership was very very adamant about and there's lots of ways to do scale Khan Academy is a great way they reach billions of learners um, you know across the globe um, smart history within Khan Academy is another great way um, having resources and they're both using the broadcast model where you've got something you can get to that um, I was just right. somewhere online somebody recently which is hey you can't really ever say you can't do something unless it's completely new in science if you will because right. you can look it up on the internet and find a way to do something if you if you want to now you're doing what I'm, what I'm impressed with is that you're thinking about it pedagogically. You're trying to say, how can we have it so we have a learning situation? So there must be some sort of learning ideas or learning, you know, a learning policy that you got, if you will, that is driving how you're doing what you're doing and how you're and how you're measuring that in some ways. Right. I mean, I think so. So to answer the question about scale, um, you know, the way that we're going to have scale is we're going to leverage the teachers out there across the globe who want a course like this, and we're going to train them in how to teach it in this online professional development program that basically certifies them, so to speak, to teach the course. Once they are certified to teach the course, they are then licensed the, the course, and they'll have some technical support about how to get the HTML5 into their learning management system. And this is something that I'm working through with EDC, you know, what's the best way to provide pedagogical support versus technical support and who, whose roles are um, responsible for that. But we felt like, you know, the way to really have scale is, you know, we're going to have to release a little bit of our authority and we're going to have to be willing to put our content out there and give that authority to classroom teachers and online teachers who want to be able to do this, but give them the support that they need. Um, so, you know, I'm hopeful that we are able to reach as many um, teachers, students as, as, want to, as they want to teach this course. And I think it's probably going to spiral its way through. You'll test with 10, then you'll test with 20, and you'll, and you'll yeah. go somewhere. Precisely. Um, I think I've got one more question that, can be, that you might be able to answer, and um, it goes back to the funding issue, which is always everybody's um, concern. And um, do you anticipate receiving renewed funding from the Wingate Foundation or future online programming, or do you think you will need to find other donors, fund so funding sources, or set up a long-term endowment for distance learning? That's from Emma Acker. <laughs> Yes, so um, all of the above, we're exploring all of those different options, and I don't think we would have gone into this without feeling really positive that we could have a model that could be sustained. That being said, to have scale, we couldn't, again, have an endowment that would hire maybe 50 online instructors, right? So that's, that just wasn't the, mod the, the model that we wanted to have. So long-term support needs to be minimal in terms of technical maintenance and instructional support but not an entire um, department. So perhaps it's an endowment, but it's one that doesn't need to be so large that it has to support a million dollar budget a year. So, you know, for instance. Um, and in thinking about, you know, just all of, all of you guys out there in, in finding funding, their districts have funding to create courses. You know, there's nothing wrong with approaching a district or approaching a school system to say, I want to be a partner. We've got the content. You have the instructors and the resources and the learning management system. You know, there's ways to leverage these partnerships and, and pool our resources together so that you don't have to go out there and find some big one-time funder or some endowment to do really innovative and, I think, be directly a part of um, the K-12 system. And I think we're running out of time. I see Barbara is about ready to come back, which is great. Um, thank you so much for being such a good resource and um, do it, sharing with us all the wonderful work that you're doing. 
Um, I'm going to put a plug in again for the Journal of Museum Education. If you want to talk a little bit about that, like 30 seconds on what that journal is going to be, because you were an editor for that, and that's coming out this summer. I think it's the July issue. Yes, so Herminia Din, um, who is an assistant professor of art education at the University of Anchorage, Alaska, is um, my co-editor, and we created a volume on distance learning, and it's not exclusive to art museums at all. We have history museums, we've got examples of um, science and uh, school partnerships, but that will be coming out this summer. And then also look for news about our Distance Learning Summit, too. So we are going to be having um, another gathering of people, um, but we are very much in the exploratory phases of that. But we'll make an announcement this summer. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Thank you so much, Anne. It's been terrific. Thank you. Barbara? OK, and thank you, Anne and Susan. What a delightful conversation. Um, thanks for your participation and audience members, too. And I encourage you to continue this conversation on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, February the 3rd, at the California Academy of Sciences. We'll be continuing the conversation with um, folks from the Exploratorium, um, SF MoMA, uh, and California State Parks, and the Cal Academy, talking about the various types of um, distance learning they're using. And Susan covered a few of those, the Khan Academy and MOOCs. So please join us. It'll be at 4.30. Um, and please share the recording of this um, webinar will be on um, YouTube and I'll put the link up on our Facebook page so please share it with your colleagues or review it before you um, join us on Tuesday so thanks so much for joining us bye bye <laughs>